Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. <laughs> good, good start of the week so far. Um, I want to talk to you all about CBDCs, centralized bank digital currencies, because not only are they trying to do it, not only are they beginning to roll it out, not only is it becoming an international standard, but the World Economic Forum recently had a meeting and they discussed how this would look. And I want to talk about this today and how this system actually works and what it means for us. Let's start with here. This is at the World Economic Forum conference in China just recently. And they talk about how CBDCs could be programmed by governments to prevent purchases that it deems undesirable. Let me play this video for you and then we'll discuss. We're developing through technology an ability for consumers to measure their own carbon footprint. What does that mean? That's where are they traveling? How are they traveling? What are they eating? What are they consuming on the platform? So individual carbon footprint tracker. Mm. Stay tuned. We don't have it operational yet, but this is something that we're working on. That's a different one. Let me play a different one for you. So that, that one is that one is about the carbon footprints, but let me let me play this other one real quick. <clears throat> And the one final note I will uh, make is that if you think about the benefits of digital money, there are huge potential gains. It's not just about uh, digital forms of physical currency. You can have programmability, you know, um, units of central bank currency with expiry dates. You could have, as I argue in my book, a potentially better, and yeah, some people might see it, or a darker world where the government decides that units of central bank money can be used to purchase some things, but not other things that it deems less desirable, like say ammunition or drugs or pornography or something of the sort. And that is very powerful in terms of the use of a CBDC. And the one final note I will uh, make is that if you think about the... Yeah, so that was at the World Economic Forum meeting in China just recently. They saw Seymour asking, WHO in China? Yeah, not only were they in China, but uh, Klaus Schwab actually came out and really praised Xi Jinping. He kind of he got called out the first day of the conference for, you know, making some positive comments about the CCP. But he ended it with just glowing praise for the Chinese Communist Party. It was, it was very bizarre to watch. But on the point of the CBDCs, they, they're, of course, keep in mind that the World Economic Forum is just a forum, a collective of individuals, uh, which is, of course, tied in with the whole you know, woke investment system, tied in with the United Nations Agenda 2030, which is the, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and tied in with the globalist agenda, which is advancing all these different programs. And so even though they're were, there were a forum, you could say, uh, the stuff they do is consequential because it does represent kind of the front line of this, the movement of this agenda and the many things they're attempting to put in place. And because of their partnerships with the United Nations, their partnership with woke investment firms like BlackRock, their partnerships or connections with many of the business leaders advancing these things, and their partnerships in individuals who were members of their organization at in government positions all around the United States, uh, they do represent a real picture of what these individuals are, in fact, trying to roll out. That being said, let's talk about what this means. So what this guy talks about, he just says you could, of course, use CBDCs to forbid certain purchases. Uh, those of you coming in, CBDC is Centralized Banking Digital Currency. The idea that the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, created really the first major one. And the CCP was also promoting this as a global standard to break away from the U.S. dollar. And the problem you have with, with, with digital currencies is that they only really work if everyone's doing them. They only really work if there's no alternative option. If the individuals, let's imagine these Chinese billionaires who suddenly have to you know, trade solely in CBDCs. They can still have suitcases full of, you know, $100 bills. They can still have dollars, even though they can no longer have the Chinese yuan as this begins rolling out fully. And so while local currency is forbidden, while local currency ends, they can still keep their money in, in other assets. 
for this entire system to work, these individuals, I think, understand it has to be global. Everybody has to be on board with it. Otherwise, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a tightly enough woven net that the forms of totalitarianism that they want to use with it, they just, you know, they, they, they need every, everybody on board, which they were actually talking about as well. Now, the problem for us, <laughs> and for well, a lot of people, is what does it mean when the bank controls the money? Well, they do already to an extent, right? The banks, well, at least the, cent the central banks, the uh, Federal Reserve here in the United States, they print the money. Personally, I do not think it should be allowed for a private bank to have that right. I think that should be through the minting office of the government, not through an external company, which is public slash private to an extent, and is profit-driven and is able to raise interest rates and steal money from Americans. I don't think that should be legal. But regardless, we do have that in place. But what happens if you have banks then issuing digital currency? And what happens if banks as private companies, not through like the U.S. Mint, not through a federal government branch, what happens when a private company can not only issue the currency, but also control the purchases? Well, what happens then is what we've been seeing with a lot of these woke companies, like Twitter and Facebook, less so these days with Twitter, but Facebook definitely, and now Threads censoring people, which is we learned that the government was censoring by proxy. We learned the federal government was surveilling by proxy. In other words, we learned that there was violations of the First Amendment of the Constitution and of the Fourth, uh, the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution to violate our rights, uh, things that are constitutionally protected, that the government itself cannot do. But because the government itself could not do it, they were doing it through proxy, through a public-private partnership. And the private business is not held by the Constitution, and they can do that. Now, what does that mean, then, if you have a mixed model economy? If you have what Klaus Schwab and others referred to as the stakeholder capitalism, it means that the banks and the big corporations essentially launch a coup. Uh, banks, corporations, investment firms, and, you know, you know, NGOs and such, essentially then want a shared stake, a shared role in government. And if they can have a shared role in government, well, this one is held to the Constitution. These ones are not. These ones can violate your rights. These ones can have you sign a terms of service agreement and you surrender your rights to free speech. They can have you sign a terms of service agreement and you surrender your rights to privacy. And if they have a monopoly on goods and also a partnership with government programs to where they have governing roles in our society, well, you end up with essentially a fast track to communism, a fast track to totalitarianism. Actually, ironically, fascism, if you understand the nature of what their policies, but actually not more Nazism, it's closer to the Nazi party. Uh, if you understand the nature of public-private partnership and how the Nazis collaborated with private businesses in order to extend their power doing that. That's the same thing the World Economic Forum is doing. And it, it gets problematic with digital currencies as well because let's say, let's say, for example, this individual talks specifically about restricting the sale of ammunition. Now, we have the Second Amendment. We can purchase firearms. We can purchase ammunition. Yeah, uh, we, we have, there's nothing stopping us from doing this. Well, a little, little bit, of, and especially depending on which state you're in. But regardless of that, you know, we, we, um, we can, for the most part, still buy guns and own guns and buy ammunition and such. And the government cannot restrict that right too much. And even the amount they're doing it right now, it's debatable how stable that is. Uh, because Congress shall make no law restricting the rights to bear arms, as we all know. Uh, that being said, though, what they can do is bypass government to do it. If, if you have a centralized bank digital currency, there's a centralized currency, and there's no other way to make online payments. Imagine all purchases are online, or maybe through a shop, or if the government regulates that you can only buy guns through a certain location. They make the firearm seller permits. You know, they, they, imagine, for example, they create, a, which they do have, 
they create a firearm seller's permit. We have to get rid of the gun shows. We have to get rid of the pawn shops. We have to make sure that there are not ghost guns, right? That's the phrase they use. We have to make sure there are no ghost guns. What does that mean? It means regulation on the sale of firearms. And so if you have regulation on the sale of firearms, it means you control the outlets through which they can be sold. If you have outlet, if you have controls in the outlets in which it can be sold, you can control essentially the modes of payment to those individuals. There's no longer bartering for guns. There's no longer grandpa, you know, giving you his old 22. There's none of that anymore because those are ghost guns. Those are untraceable guns. Those are, those are dangerous guns on our streets. They have to regulate it, right? And so once they regulate the locations and modes of sale, what happens is that you can regulate the currency used to initiate and have those transactions. And if the banks have centralized bank digital currency, it means every payment is monitored. Every payment can be approved and every payment can be canceled. Certain goods could be restricted. And so if you try to use your centralized bank digital currency to then purchase a firearm or purchase ammunition, even though it's illegal in the country under the Constitution, the bank issuing the currency, having a monopoly on the currency, can say, we are not going to allow this purchase to take place. If you remember, that was one of the big issues with PayPal. PayPal, of course, is a digital payment service. And PayPal ran into a lot of controversy not too long ago for announcing, although they claimed they never rolled it out, announcing a program that would fine people. It would charge you money if you said things that were quote unquote hateful. And ima so imagine you, you know, you have like $10,000. I, I don't think it has that much in PayPal, but imagine with me. Imagine you had $10,000 in your PayPal account and you say something racist on the internet or deemed racist because it's such a broad term these days. And suddenly you get fined like $1,000 by PayPal. The company seizes it and they can do it because through the terms of service agreement, you've agreed to allow them to do it. Was it $1,500 crash band? It was something like that. They also, if you remember, PayPal had already restricted the use of their digital currency to purchase firearms. And so they already put that in place. That was allowed. That took place. And nobody did anything about it because they don't have a monopoly. But again, the issue is that they want a monopoly. They don't want even just a national monopoly. They want a global monopoly, a shared global digital currency. And as the other individual I showed you the video of noted, they also want things like an individual carbon footprint tracker, where uh, if you eat meat, for example, well, that's bad for the environment, cows fart. Uh, so obviously they need, they need to dox you some points on that. Maybe if you eat crickets, you'll get bonus points on your carbon tracker. If you drive a car too much, well, down on those points, buy a, an electric vehicle, which uses electricity powered by, ironically, fossil fuels, but, but ignore, ignore the man behind the curtain momentarily. <laughs> well, then, well, then, of course, maybe you get a few bonus points as well. Drive that diesel truck. Well, I'm sorry, buddy. Yeah, that's going to affect your carbon footprint. And they, they already actually have credit cards that do this, by the way. Currently, it's a voluntary program. Currently, it's, it's a, you could say it's a pilot program. They're testing it, uh, but, but this is already available. Car, uh, credit cards that track your carbon footprint based on the purchases you're making. And I believe that will I even disable itself uh, if, you, if you go over a limit. The point is, though, this is the direction we're heading in with cashless economies. This is the direction we're heading in with CBDCs. This is the direction we're heading in with things like Zello and so on. Uh, in some countries, like in Australia, I'm aware that most payments are already done through digital means, even between individuals. You know, you, you tap your smartphones or something like that. And it's a, it's a very easy way to give cash to your friends and such. It's not like grandma sending you a birthday card with, you know, 50 bucks or something like that. It's, it's, uh, it's very different. It's digital payments and they just wire it to you. Uh, in some countries, this is already the norm. And... Uh, if we, if we don't embrace the, the let's say cash <laughs> like paper money fiat currency unfortunately but maybe that'll change one day uh, the next step is going to be digital currencies and they, they are actively trying to roll it out that said folks let's jump over to epoch tv because i want to show you something really funny 
Remember how we were talking about Ben and Jerry's? Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And we talked about how cancel culture was coming for Ben and Jerry's because Ben and Jerry's talked about returning America's stolen land to the Native Americans. Well, after Ben and Jerry's called for stolen land to be returned to the Native Americans, a Native American tribe that actually has claim to the land where the Ben and Jerry's massive facility is built on, uh, they're asking Ben and Jerry's to give them back the stolen land. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about that. That said, those of you on YouTube, join me on Epoch TV. We'll talk about this. We'll go into questions. So I will see you on Epoch TV. Uh, link in the description below and come join us. <sighs> Folks, I, th I think the phrase for the